A lot of time you have to get to a point of rock bottom. Where do you go from having nothing? And you can go wherever you want. So in a way it's very liberating. That inner critic will always come back in and say, that's not good enough. Creativity is the intersection between play and experimentation. There is no perfectionism in either of those things. The idea of perfection is an illusion and same with good and bad. Maybe the question should be more like, is what I'm doing the most loving thing I can do? The most powerful thing that I've learned is self-acceptance. And part of self-acceptance is just to go, this is what happened. What can I do from this point onwards? Vulnerability being a superpower isn't always the easiest thing to get to. You talk about myopic ways of doing things and viewing things. That is the very antithesis of creativity. Hey, Heart Leader community, this is Amber Mikesell, and I am so excited. Silent Your Inner Critic has a release date. We'll be hitting shelves March of 2025, and you have an opportunity to get on the wait list by clicking the link below. And when you do, you're going to immediately get a gift from me. It is the Silent Your Inner Critic Starter Kit, where you'll get 13 tips to get started on silencing your inner critic before the book hits the shelves. <laughs> Hello, Amazing Heart Leader community, and welcome to this episode of the Heart Leader podcast, where our hearts and our minds align. We are so grateful to have our creative director here at Suivera, Robert Alexander Doran, with us today. He is going to dive deep into a continuation of what we were talking about in our last podcast his segments on silencing the inner critic and what led him to cover the sections he did and a little deeper dive into how he got to a place where he could be as vulnerable as he is in that section of the course and just in life overall, because vulnerability being a superpower isn't always the easiest thing to get to. So how can someone who's navigated all he has in his life get to a point now where he's actually able to be vulnerable and open at least most of the time? So thank you, Robert, for being here and really for coming out and being with us in Arizona. I know you and I were chatting and I was like, man, it took a lot of courage and vulnerability to get on a plane, fly from the UK to Arizona and stay with people that you never actually met in person for a week and a half and stay in our home above all things. So like, and never being in this space before this place uh, in Arizona before either. So yeah. talk about courage and hoops fall, man. Well, thank you for having me today. Again, it was a great blast last time. Thank you for having me for over a week. I think the courage was on you guys to have crazy British person, a British being, as you put it in one of our adult <laughs> videos, in your house for over a week. So it goes both ways. It's a collaboration, not a one-way street, as you're always often saying. But yeah, like, you know, thankfully, I have managed to get you into Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and spoiler alert for anyone that's not seen it, but like at the end of the first series, when Jake's going into undercover for the FBI, he's like, Eyes closed, head first, that's how you do it, straight in. And I know that's not the most cautious way of living life, but sometimes it works out all right. <laughs> yeah, it turned out beautifully. Like exactly. We've gone through withdrawal with you not being here now. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. That's I, I can't <laughs> explain that, but same, same goes here. I miss being there. Yeah, that's a true team, though. Exactly, we and we have, like, just for anyone watching this who might wonder what's gone on there, we have been working together for over a year, virtually, so, like, me showing up at your house wasn't that weird, realistically. <laughs> yeah. It just turned out that Austin was about four foot, four foot, four inches taller than I was maybe expecting. <laughs> yeah, Big there old is level giant. <laughs> there is that part too. Like you see people on camera and then you meet them and it's like, wait a second. Yeah. They're not. Yeah, the opposite went for Rosie. Like I was not expecting her to be quite as petite as she turned out to be. She's feisty <laughs> considering, isn't she? she <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. What is the saying? Dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> 
Something like that. <laughs> Although uh, Mr. Nobel regretted creating dynamite, so then founded the Nobel Peace Prize. So that's true. I don't know why I've gone to that. That was the first thing my head goes to, but <laughs> we can dive into how my mind works in terms of creativity and addiction. Let's go. There we go. And I love it because it sounds like we were the three bears for you as Goldilocks. Austin was bigger, Rosie was smaller, and I was just right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so let's dive in because we spent a lot of time while you were here creating this course that will be launching what we're calling our flagship course. And you bravely stepped up and said, okay, I will take on how the inner critic really takes hold of the addictive addiction process and how that actually can roll into creativity and stifling creativity and how to move through that. Not suppress it, not go around it, but actually go through this as someone who's been there. How did you get to a point where you'd be willing to share something like that? Because that's highly vulnerable and it takes a lot of courage. Just like coming here takes a lot of courage. That took a lot of courage. Well, like when you say that it was really brave, that to me feels weird to accept because I don't think it's brave. I think like it is what it is. So realistically, the hardest part of the last few years where I've dealt with all these things, like especially coming out of drinking alcohol heavily, the most powerful thing that I've learned is self-acceptance. And part of self-acceptance is just to go, this is what happened. Maybe I was a total dum-dum. Maybe I shouldn't have been drinking 12 cans of IPA every night, but I did. Like an idiot. What can I do from this point onwards? And that is to not do that. <laughs> it is to look after my body. And then if I can help empower anyone else to also make a change for the better in the same kind of way, then why not? Why wouldn't I? You know what I mean? Yeah. I know you had mentioned in the course, like having doing the best you can where you are and not needing to be all the way. Like having a goal, obviously, but you being grateful for where you are as you're moving toward where you desire to go. Because that inner critic will always come back in and say, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. Can you dive um, into that a little bit and how you moved through that? Well, that goes for creativity and addiction. Like if you're coming away from a substance or a behavior, there's always a chance you're going to fall off the wagon. And what's going to be more beneficial? Doing, beating yourself up and going 12 rounds with yourself and then feeling bad so you end up staying off the wagon and drinking more or whatever the behavior is that you're trying to get away from as your crutch or going, ah, oh, I fell off the wagon, I'll get back on it. You know what I mean? Same thing for creativity. Like perfectionism is the, it's the Sith to the Jedi <laughs> of creativity being the Jedi and the Sith being perfectionism. As much as the inner critic well, the inner critic's a perfectionist, isn't it? Like, you'll go, oh, that's not good enough. You can do better. It's not, it's not as perfect as it could be. Things don't need to be perfect. They need to be worthwhile when it comes to creativity. And worthwhile in itself is subjective. When I was talking to Dr. Rosie Kuhn yesterday, seen, heard, and gotten, <laughs> of seen, heard, and gotten fame, <laughs> I said that um, creativity is the intersection between play and experimentation. And if you can see it from that standpoint, like there is no perfectionism in either of those things. You know what I mean? So what really sums this up nicely is what Steve Atcho said to you a few guest episodes back where he quoted Tim Ferriss and said, the mediocre plan that you stick to is better than the perfect plan that you give up on and that's so true 
So true. In terms of like my fitness journey since quitting alcohol, that's been the benchmark of what I've done. I set myself a standard of three days a week in the gym. I set myself a goal of five days a week in the gym. It averages out at four. That's that's good enough for me. If I can do that every week, I'm going to be physically fit. Am I going to look like The Rock? No. Am I aiming to look like The Rock? No. So there's also an element of intention and clarity required. Like, what are you actually trying to achieve? Because if you're like, airy fairy, I want to look like The Rock, but I'm only going to go to the gym once a month, your intention and your willingness to do the activity aren't matching. So you need to have that kind of awareness. But other than that, do as much as you can. Forgive yourself for what you can't do. Did that that answer the question? (laughs) It does. How does that keep you on target? That's, for me, when I am first starting out on something, I'm one of those, I like a plan and I like a goal. And even in creativity, there might be a time where it's like, I know that I need to let go of the end result, but that's hard to do. So Mm. if there's someone who is in the creative aspect or even in the addictive aspect, their family is putting pressure on them or their loved ones are putting pressure on them to do it. And so their focus is on that end goal instead of those incremental steps that get to the end goal. Do you have any personal advice for how to be okay with those incremental steps and not feel like they have to be at that end goal already? Because there's a lot of pressure from the outside sometimes. And then that feeds the pressure from the inside that's already there to just be there already. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I would say try, try doing whatever it is you're trying to do with only the end goal in mind. See how quickly you fail and then come back to it knowing that that isn't the way forward. For example, with fitness again, my Um, In 2021, I did a fitness program that was 10 weeks. The personal train of running the fitness program was like, yeah, I'm going to get you ripped. Guess what happened? I wasn't ripped in 10 weeks. (laughs) After two weeks, in fact, I was injured and I didn't even complete the program. When you have that end goal in mind, and often I find with things like that, the end goal isn't just the end goal. It's an inflated end goal. Like, Honestly, unless you're willing to put every moment of every day into something like fitness for 10 weeks, you're not going to change your body all that much. It goes back to that thing, uh, that quote, famous quote, and I can't remember who said it, might have been Warren Buffett. People uh, overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years, something along those lines. It's just about seeing things on a longer time horizon. Like you are more likely to get to maybe not even the goal, but something where you're actually happy, like fulfilled with the work that you've done. If you put in a long, put in the work for a long time, you know what I mean? But I think at least for me, because of my complex, somewhat defunct personality, I have to learn everything in the hardest, most drawn out way possible And then when I've learned it, I've learned it. You know what I mean? (laughs) So like trying, telling me that I I had loads of time and that I should just do a little bit every day. I was never going to listen to that advice. I needed to try things, taking shortcuts and doing all the hacks. And then coming back to it and going, actually, none of those things work. I might as well just try and stay consistent with a consistent amount of effort that I can put in instead of trying to go real hard for 10 weeks and then being disappointed. Yeah. It seems like what you're bringing forward is, is what we talk about often on this podcast and within ourselves is, is 
shifting the from uh, orientation around results into process, right? So perfection, perfectionism is inherently a result and creativity is inherently a process. You don't, you're just, you're not just, creativity isn't a result, at least in my experience and from my, my perspective, it's something that can, it's a continuation, it's a growth, it's an expansion. Mm. Uh, and so I think it's, it's something that what you're bringing forward even uh, is the idea of these goals. I think, I think maybe there's a, a misconception that a goal is a result. Uh, where a goal can be a, a continuation, it could be a creative process in that sense to create benchmarks and help us understand where we are in the process without having to be the have the rigidity of, of a result. 100%. It's just a direction. I think there's been, like I said, uh, a miscommunication when it comes to personal development, business development, that a goal is something that has to be hit. Like if you're, if you're quantifying it and it's like, we're looking to make $50,000 this month in revenue, mm -hmm. you either hit that mark or you don't. But when it comes to personal development, either like in trying to give up a substance in creating projects, whether that is artistic or not, there has to be flow there. There has to not be rigidity because part of being creative is to have that flow. As soon as you're like put in a box and you can only, uh, you talk about myopic ways of doing things and viewing things, that is the very antithesis of creativity. So cr to be creative, whether that is in artistic realms or just in how you brush your teeth, <laughs> which is something that you brought up before Austin. Like it is to be able to do things in different ways because a lot of creativity comes down to problem solving. If every problem could be solved in a myopic way, we wouldn't have any problems as humans anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, problems are more complex than that. Humans are more complex than that. If you think that you're going to go through life being able to just go, yes, no, yes, no, to every problem in your life without really giving it any thought, it's not going to work that way, unfortunately. <laughs> I would know because I wish I tried to make it work that way in my early 20s and nah. <laughs> so accepting that things aren't always going to work out, but having the creativity and like the identity of being creative enough to have flexibility in those situations is where I would hopefully empower people to be. Yeah. So you mentioned in your 20s, you had a different direction. And somewhere along the way, you must have fallen into stoicism because we've had lots of discussions around stoicism. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to talk about what, how you tripped and fell into the stoic philosophy? What led you there? Yes, I am willing to. It's not as fun a story as it could be, possibly. Uh, I followed a creator called Will Schaefer on Instagram. He was talking about it a fair bit. And then one of the PTs at the gym that I go to, he was all into stoicism. I was like, what's this all about? Uh, came across Ryan Holiday's youtube channel and then podcast he's the author of the daily stoic and then just got into it from there like i said not a particularly exciting way very 21st century especially considering we're talking about a, a philosophy that's thousands of years old but that's what i do appreciate about ryan holiday he has brought stoicism into the 21st century and given it like that right that rejuvenation that it deserved so yeah, ryan holiday i have uh, discipline is destiny somewhere I think it's on that bookshelf over there and uh, I've got Epictetus Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and then there's plenty of other books which I will read at some point as well awesome for those who have no idea what stoicism is help them help us understand the stoic philosophy 
as was brought forward by those individuals that you just mentioned and how it's been brought into the 21st century. Because I find it fascinating that there's this new reemergence because it kind of sat in a, we talked about stoicism. We talked about Vedic philosophy. We talked about stoicism. If you were someone who loved to contemplate philosophy, But now there's like this rise of both really happening as we're looking at how do we solve some of these global issues that we're having. So it would be great to hear from your perspective as someone who's recently come into the fold in that perspective. So if people have seen the film Gladiator, which I assume is quite a lot of people, Marcus Aurelius is one of the main names in Stoic philosophy. He wasn't the founder, that was Zeno in ancient Greece. But Marcus Aurelius, in his book Meditations, gave a lot of great Stoic philosophy. So that's the name that you may know prior to actually knowing what Stoic philosophy is. And Meditations was actually his personal diary, which I find fascinating in terms of how it was written. Because, as you know, Amber, being a quantum scientist in terms of your master's degree, if something is being observed, it will act differently. Marcus Aurelius wasn't being observed when writing these things. He's literally writing it to himself. Like, what? how much more authentic could it be? What? So I really enjoy that aspect of how that was written. But essentially, Stoic philosophy... Is based is around based around how to be a good person, and I like it because there isn't any kind of dogma really attached to it. It's not like do this or you're going to hell, which, as we know, a lot of major religions rely on. It's literally just saying like, here's how to be a good person. Here's how we have figured how to be a good person. Take it or leave it. And a lot of that comes down to you do not have control over what happens to you, but you always control how you react or respond, which you talk about often without tying it to stoicism. It's fascinating that you can be a stoic person, not stoic in the way that the word stoic has come to mean, but stoic is in the philosophy. You can be a, a proponent of Stoic philosophy. That's what I'm looking to say, without actually ever knowing anything about it. It comes naturally to some people. For the people like me, who it doesn't come naturally to, it's really great that these books have been written for to teach people how life can be if you stop reacting to everything external and actually process it internally in order to be a better person. And like, for example, Marcus Aurelius said, uh, stop arguing about what a good man is and just be one. And like, there's lots of little uh, like soundbite-esque quotes like that, which are fantastic. And for somebody with ADHD, like me, I, I appreciate that because I don't want to learn chapters of the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like to be able to have little one sentence at a time kind of quotes to remind you of like the power that is within perfect. And that, but that's probably what attracted me to it in all honesty. That's amazing. And I think that that highlights having many different paths is so fantastic because there are many different personality types that need those many different paths. Vedic philosophy has a lot of the same principles and came mm-hmm way before Stoicism, but the Stoic philosophers didn't know Vedic philosophy. Mm. So the principles are the same. There's kind of a universal truth about how to create a positive society. And it starts with being a positive person, right? The universal truth of don't be a dick. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I love it. But... What attracts someone to one philosophy over another really is 
Austin's Baskin Robbins approach, <laughs> right? Mm. What really calls to you? And it doesn't make Vedic philosophy better than Stoicism, better than Christianity, better than Buddhism, better than Taoism. It just makes it a different way to not be a dick. Yeah. I think what I appreciate, going back to the whole thing of it not being dogmatic, along the lines of that thought train of thought, is that there's very little in the way of being able to corrupt Stoic philosophy. Whereas, like, as we have seen across the globe, Christianity, massively, Islam, massively, and even Buddhism has been taken by the wrong people and used for bad. <laughs> because there's bits in there which are open to interpretation. Whereas, like, a lot of the Stoic writings from my... Uh, understanding are open to interpretation however the inter all the interpretations that you come up with lead towards the same kind of path that's just my experience i may be totally wrong i don't like how organized religion has been used as a force for oppression stoic philosophy hasn't not as of yet that's why i like it <laughs> partly What are your thoughts? I don't know much about stoicism, to be honest. So um, I, I don't really have a lot right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. Full transparency. I, I really don't. I mean, I think based on what you're saying, it sounds like um, a lot of a lot of philosophy and and, and religion uh, is ha, has opportunity, I guess, because there's to misinterpret because there's a, a lot of words. There are a lot of words. There's a lot of parables. There's a lot of different ideas. So if you're saying that it's really simple, it's hard to misinterpret a small amount of words, or at least harder. And so maybe the simplicity of it and, and the minimalistic opportunity kind of drops it down and, and at least maybe narrows it down in terms of uh, the spectrum in which it can be expressed. Uh, and, and so if it is narrow and in, and aligned with the intention and the purpose of a philosophy, then it makes it a little bit easier to execute. Whereas something like some of these major religions or major faiths that have been utilized in different ways uh, can be misinterpreted for an egoic uh, aspect uh, that can then turn around and say, you know, hey, this is this is this is the word of God, and so you know, I need to do this to oppress you or something like that. When that's not actually what was said, but it could be interpreted in that way. Uh, and so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see, uh, you know, there's definitely just, just like any, any faith and anything, there's a lot of amazing people who do interpret it in, in the love and in the connection that it was maybe originally meant. And that's a beautiful thing and that doesn't disregard, but, um, but yeah, I do. It's, it is, it is interesting to, to learn more and hear these different faiths and see how a lot of them are saying different things in different ways. But I do like what I'm hearing in terms of the stoicism aspect of it being a little bit more uh, simplistic and straightforward. So there's not as much uh, room for misinterpretation. And I should also add, like, I have absolutely nothing against anyone who follows Christianity, Islam, atheism, or any other, other philosophy or religion, as long as they're doing good in the world. When you start using it to excuse, like, bad behavior or traditions i'm not a fan and that get, that's across the board so just want to throw that in there as well yeah which and is why rivera doing religion differently haha -ha. yes. <laughs> exactly but i think it is also important to know as we're having this discussion the difference between religion which is organized structure and philosophy which is not so mm. I would say like philosophy leads into spirituality. Yes. As opposed to people, you say spirituality and people go, oh, religion. Hmm. Not necessarily. Like religion is more kind of spirituality that's handed to you in church or wherever. Do you know what I mean? Like this that's is how organized. to do it. Whereas philosophy, it's like, have you thought about this? And you go, oh, never thought of it that way. I'll take that on board. 
You know what I mean? It's, a, it's just a bit lighter, which works for my personality because I'm not very good at being told what to do unless it makes total sense. <laughs> okay. I think it's important when viewing philosophy to also take into account what is good and what is bad. You know, that's such a relative term. You know, what comes off to us as, as bad, someone else might say, well, that's good for them. And so, yeah. it, you know, that's where this idea, you know, if we pull back to perfectionism and, and why perfection, the idea of perfection is an illusion is because what, what perfection means to you, what it means to me, what it means to Amber, what it means to anyone listening, uh, it's all different. And so we can't, if, if it's, if it's an end result with one thing, yet it happens to be all these different, uh, different approaches, then, then it, in, in essence, it's an illusion and same with good and bad. Maybe the question should be more like, you know, is what I'm doing the most loving thing I can do? You know, that's yeah, that's yeah. that's less ambiguous. That's a little bit more direction focused. And it kind of reminded me of like last night we were watching Ted Lasso. It seems like we're right in around the same area in terms of uh, season three. I love that um, show. <laughs> where they're playing total football, right? And they're saying, yeah, yeah. you know, the question was, he pulled back and was like, hey, you know, I just looked at the situation. I said, you know, what can I do to help? How can I support? What's most needed right What's now? What's most needed right now? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's a beautiful, loving question. And so, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, maybe this opportunity is for humanity is to begin to release these concepts of, of, of good and bad and just yeah, creating yeah, a judgment yeah. around them and start actually like what Ted says, you know, be curious. Yeah. And right? be a goldfish. And be yeah. a goldfish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But be, be curious and, and start start asking questions and then helping that lead to the direction that we're looking for. I have a story around this, which includes a little bit of something I came up with, which is probably the most stoic thing I, I could do, but it was before I actually knew much about stoicism. So just over two years now ago, my dad and I were driving into the town in Surrey that he was brought up in. And he asked me, do I resent him and my mum for bringing me up where they did? Mm. I said, no. Why? <laughs> and he's like, because I resent my parents for bringing me up here. Like, he hated it. He really hated it. Wow. And I was like, fair enough. Well, no, I don't resent you for bringing me up where you did. I don't resent you for bringing me up how you did. Because I know that you were doing everything you could with the information and tools you had available to you. And that is all you can ever expect of anyone. And that's my quote. I came up with that. Someday that will be printed in a book. But like, it's true. You can. That was me. <laughs> yeah. All you can ever expect anyone to do is the best they can with the, with the tools and information that they have available to them. And when you take that into account, Perfectionism goes out the window because we're all human. We can only ever do the best we can in that moment. And if what we're doing in that moment is the best that we can, every, if everyone did that, we'd all, we'd all be a lot happier, I'm sure. But unfortunately, it's people that choose not to. But if but we were also willing to accept that maybe people are doing the best that they can, with yeah. what they know and where they are, then we could begin to release judgment and in turn free ourselves. And that as well. Thank you for adding that on at the end. I've lost my train of thought a little, but that rounds it off perfectly. Thank you. Yeah. That's, a good, <laughs> that's a good question though. Like for me in terms of this is, you know, are people really doing the best that they can? Are they just falling into unconscious behavior and not actually seeking to be the best version of who they are? And so that's where I have, I love what you're bringing forward. And I think that's a great, in many ways, an assumption to, and it would be wonderful if we were in a space where that was occurring. Um, but I think I, my, my struggle with that concept is uh, I, I genuinely don't feel a lot of people are doing the best that they could be doing. Uh, not from a judgment standpoint, but just because I too, and I know that my, I know I'm not doing the best that I could be in, in, in areas and the more conscious that I can be, the yeah, the better that gets. But that's where the doing the best with the information and tools available comes in. Because some people haven't had the information shown to them. 
I know, like I mentioned my 20s before, like I, I, I knew that people were making money on the internet, but I had no idea how until I was 27. And then a, a single video changed everything. And it was, it was a guy called World Nate, who was a travel blogger, talking about how he made six figures a year in affiliate commissions from blogging whilst traveling. And I was like, so that's how this is done. I mean, clearly I'm not a travel blogger. I did want to give it a go. But in watching that video, my mind was just exponentially expanded to the opportunity, the potential. A lot of people just haven't come across anything that gives them that like light bulb moment to be able to do better in their lives. Yeah, it's it's a very great so, point. There's also many people are doing things even though they know they should be doing something differently or better or you know i mean that's a relative term but how many how many times are people like going back to your your point about don't be a dick well how, well how many people are 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 just either rude or or not kind even though they know that they can be like they've been kind or nice to people in the past you know why does that have to be a fleeting thing or why does it have to be you know, in, in those moments, why can't we dig deeper and seek a, a greater version of ourselves and, mm-hmm. and be nice on a more consistent basis? And so we don't have to have a, a blanket term like don't be a dick. <laughs> you know, we can we can actually, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I think that's where I'm co- more coming from is like how often uh, when we do have the tools and resources and we are aware of it, yet we still choose to not be that that greatest version of, of who we are, you know? Yeah. Why is that so ingrained uh, from that unconscious behavior? Maybe we're not done learning that yet. Yeah. Maybe we and, need to go through it a couple more times. And going into addiction, I know that I didn't make the best choices that I could have for years, honestly, through internal pain. Like, I was drinking heavily as an escape from being who I am. (laughs) And like, yeah, I'm a bit weird. I accept that now. I don't care. Luckily, I'm past 30, so. Just (laughs) limited edition. (laughs) (laughs) We're not weird. We're just limited edition. That's what we say. Exactly. (laughs) But like, I, I never wanted to accept that. And that created a lot of internal like dissonance and pain and led me to drinking heavily to try and cover who I was and in doing so when you're in that low vibrational frequency state I feel like both of you probably know this Austin based on the stories that you've told on this very podcast like I know you've been there like Mm -hmm it's a hard place to live and getting out of it is tough but it's so worthwhile and I think a lot of people don't have well I know that I didn't have the awareness that another option was available and as soon as that kind of awareness is brought forward everything can change and just to drive this point home somewhat, uh, we b- both moved house within the set. Well, it was a, t- a day apart that we picked up the keys, wasn't it? It was. In moving here, I don't have anywhere for like the weight station that I had. It was a bench and a barbell, a bunch of weights. I go to the gym three to five times a week. We've discussed this already. So yesterday, I sold all the weights I had. And it was this guy who came out, he brought his 13 year old son who it was for. And I was, it's mind blowing to me now that there's that much like education online and in with young people around fitness that there's a 13 year old coming to buy my weights. Like I didn't have that awareness as a kid. It was like, do you want to do weightlifting? No, I don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was like that much of a jump. And you know, that whole thing of like when um, it's stereotypical for women to go, 
no, I don't want to do weights. I don't want to be bulky. And James Smith makes this joke that it's not like you do some weight sneeze and then you're huge. It doesn't work like that. But there's a lot of, there's so much education around it now that like 13 year olds are doing it. All I wanted to do when I was 13 was play guitar. And shortly after that, I was smoking weed. Like kids now are making such better choices because the information is available. So I'd like to think humanity is on an upward tra trajectory. Maybe not the <laughs> vertical trajectory we'd all hope for, but it's going the right way, potentially. Yeah. And ultimately, even in that space, for people that I've talked with and have assisted, you could be in that, what we call the lower vibrational space where you're caught in guilt, you're caught in self-loathing. You can get all those tools and know that those two tools are available, but it's like climbing out of the deepest pit. So mm. it, you're not just going to go, as you said, from here straight up. It's mm. going to be that incline climb. And so, and sometimes you're going to fall backward. And you're going to have to climb a little bit again, and then you got to rest. And so you might be resting from grief and self-loathing self in anger and be angry at the world. So how can you not be a dick if you're angry at the world? And that's still climbing up from self-loathing and grief. So we have to recognize those incremental steps and honor people where they are. Otherwise, they're just going to go right back into self-loathing, mm -hmm. right? And that's not going to be helpful. So and, and understand to keep empowering, where people And to keep empowering people to know that apathy isn't the only option. Because that was, for me, that's something I battle with on a daily basis. I say daily. Often, there's a little nihilist in the back of my head. That's probably, my inner critic is an apathetic nihilist. <laughs> and it's like, it's back there going, what's the point? Why bother? And if you can fight against that, you can do anything, potentially. <laughs> but at Both least, things. <laughs> that's so again, like, you don't have to win everything. The important thing is that you do at least try. Yeah. Do you or do not? There is no try. <laughs> I think this really brings... Oh, yeah. But <laughs> the interesting thing about that is you either do or do not it's not like, so they are doing football in Ted Lasso. They are trying to win everything. They are attempting. So you can do both. They're not trying to play football, though. Ah, language. It's a weird one, isn't it? It is. It is. I think it, it, this really boils down to what you say, Robert, is which, which hard choice are you going to choose? Because mm. both are. And oftentimes we get this illusion that um, not being the best version of ourselves is the easy way out. Uh, when oftentimes it's actually like, it's hard to be angry all the time. Ooh, it's yes. hard to be self-loathing. It takes a lot of effort. And I don't think draining. that we, yeah, it's draining. It's, I, I mean, I, I've been there. Like I, I, I personally haven't been, a, haven't experienced addiction, but a lot of the choices I were making would make it almost look like that. Uh, and, and I knew that like they were choices and drinking the way I was, um, you know, how much I was working. I mean, I was, I was addicted. I, I, I wasn't addicted, but I had, I was actively choosing all these things that actually made my life harder. And I was, and a lot of it was because, oh, well, this is, this is easier than dealing with, you know, attempting to figure out who I am, or this is easier mm -hmm. than, you know, dealing with a situation. So I'll just go party instead, or I'll just go, you know, forget this, or, you know, I won't take on responsibility. I won't take personal responsibility, you know, but all these things were actually, I was just digging a, a deeper ditch for myself and making it actually, I feel a lot harder. And it wasn't until that I, I, I chose what I felt like was an illusion of a harder choice it actually ended up being easier because yeah. it, you know, there's a reason why it's like when you're, when you feel free, you feel light. Uh, it's like you're actually lifting all these weights off of you, the weight of the world, the weight of all these emotions that we have and these feelings. And we, we just kind of lift them. We let them go. You know, that's what higher vibration means. And it's actually 
feel and for me it's a lot easier uh, I mean so much easier to stay in that space of positivity and and connection and personal responsibility because the idea of of not doing that is actually now it feels like I'd be carrying a, a wheelbarrow behind me and I don't I really don't want to do that <laughs> so, uh, so it's funny how the hard choice has actually now become the easy choice and what seemed like the easy choice is actually much harder for me to choose and so I, it really is perception and, and it's our opportunity to kind of dive in and and really explore like what what hard choice do we want and I thought that was such a great quote uh, that you brought up I think as a society, Western society, British and American, the educational system, how we treat young people might be changing now. But in my day, back in my day, most people are old <laughs> saying that, it was very much like you you go to school, you get a job, you buy the house, you have the kids, you do that for 40 years and then you retire. And that is seen as the easy way. And that then kind of bleeds into other aspects of life as well. Like I vividly remember in my early 20s, often think just wishing that I would be okay. And to be okay meant to be like settled. Like, this is me we're talking about. Like, I'm not going to be settled like everyone else because that would be hell. My mind isn't going to allow that kind of uh, that level of activity. That I need more stimulation because ADHD. So, like, the for me, the easier thing to then do when I accepted it was to take the risk of working for myself. And although I'm the creative director of Severa, I'm on a contractor basis. Like, I have to take responsibility for the amount of effort and work that I put in for you guys to want to keep me around. You know what I mean? And there is that level of personal responsibility, which at the time when you first realize that is like, Oh, what do you mean? I'm not going to just get paid for sitting on the toilet, which I did a lot of <laughs> <laughs> those days are gone. I actually have to get paid for doing what I'm meant to be doing. And like, when you initially have that, it's like, oh, that's scary. But then you do it. It's like, actually, you know what? This is far more fulfilling. I have freedom over my time. I have freedom over where in the world I can go as long as there's a good internet connection. Yeah. It's like it's like there's a big wall. There's like a nice little playground where all the easy wanting people hang out. And they're having an all right time, but there's this massive wall. And if you climb it, there's a wonderland on the other side. Yeah. Like, do you choose to go over that wall or do you just stick uh, playing in a, like a sand pit in the playground? You know what I mean? And like, yeah, it's hard to make the decision to do the hard thing. Well, it's, but it's going to be just as hard to not do it in the long run. It's like an investment thing. I often look at things now as like, do I want to put upfront time, energy, and effort into something to then have a long-term uh, payoff? Or do I want to do a little bit here and there every, every now and then? I'd rather just do it all as a lump sum kind of down payment. You know what I mean? <laughs> nice. Yeah. I th yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does. A lot of energy now or a little bit of energy over a longer period of time? Which ultimately on as an aggregate, I think I'm using that word right, ends up being more energy. Because mm -hmm. there's compact, like going into financial terms here. There's compound interest on the energy that you're willing to put in. So like if you put in 10 units of energy into like getting fit and carry on doing that, you then end up with more energy from getting fit. Or you can choose not to and the compounding effects of not getting fit are that you end up with like diabetes, heart issues and all sorts going wrong with you. 
Luckily, my back was giving out, not as bad as yours, Austin, obviously. And I didn't have much of an option. That's another thing to uh, segue into in terms of like addiction and making a change. A lot of time you have to get to a point of rock bottom. And as not Dr. Wesley Snipes, Dr. Wesley (laughs) Cress said, (laughs) rock bottom is where there's no more energy to maintain a goic structure. And from there, you can do anything like in Fight Club, like just let go. And if you hit rock bottom, you're free. And I have done that physically. I've done it mentally. I've done it spiritually, spiritually. And like, where do you go from having nothing? And you can go wherever you want. So in a way, it's very liberating. It's a, it sucks to be there. But like physically, when my back was given out, it was, do I maintain this amount of pain and pay for a chiropractor to fix me for a couple of weeks at a time? Or do I just make my back stronger and have long-term benefits? And when you, th- when I, at least when I think about it in that way, it's like, it's a no brainer. You know what I mean? Like, why wouldn't somebody do this? But then again, you only know that once you've gone, gone through it. Yeah. I think that's a great point to wrap up on here as we, begin to share your contact information. As you mentioned, you contract with us, but that also means that you would be available to help other individuals with their creative endeavors. We don't want to hold you all to ourselves, but we can definitely sing your praises and let others know you are phenomenal in so many different aspects from helping us pull our podcast together and to a level now that is, we just continue to grow and you help us get ahead of the game. We're setting the bar now instead of following the lead of others who are setting the bar. And we love that place to be. And you're also helping as we're developing our own personal brands you have personal brand experience and you are assisting from that aspect. So do you want to tell individuals what you do as a creative director and how they might be able to get a hold of you? I do what's necessary. Going back to what we were saying in terms of total football. Um, In terms of taking on anyone else who I may be able to help, it'd be on a consulting basis. If they want help with personal branding, uh, help with setting up a studio because although you guys aren't in that studio today go check out the previous episode i helped with that, setting that up yeah yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah you did and then just anything else in terms of like content um also if anyone did want help in terms of help with being more creative they can check out the science you're in a critic course that's coming out if they wanted to work with me personally, I'm more than happy to talk about those kinds of subjects. Anything around addiction, I'm not, I haven't been through a 12 step program, but I'm more than happy to share what I've done and to help empower and support people going through that. And then, like I said, my ADHD, if you're ADHD and you want a different life, I am, I've been through <laughs> being stuck in working in call centers and being at the depths of depression, largely due to not knowing where my place in the world was because being ADHD didn't allow me to fit into the paradigm that I've been told that I needed to be in. So if you want help with breaking free of the paradigm that you're in, hit me up. Also, you have to deal with me being ADHD myself. So (laughs) (laughs) So you keep it interesting. Limited edition. Limited, Limited edition. edition. Exactly. Exactly. And um, you want to share your website and we'll have it linked below? You can do. It needs a bit of work on it because I haven't done anything on that for a few months. Well, it's now. like a hairdresser, uh, right? You want to go to the hairdresser who has the worst hair because that means they're focusing on everybody else's hair? Something like that. It's just my name, robertalexanderduran.com. Uh, my email address is contact at robertalexanderduran.com and you'll be able to find me on YouTube, Instagram, 
not really doing Facebook now because, you know, old news. Yeah. <laughs> think perfect we love facebook just <laughs> i know i i i messed up my profile by following the advice of business gurus who were like yeah just add loads of friends yeah then it doesn't become that enjoyable to use but yes follow swivera on uh facebook if you haven't if you're coming to swivera through the heart leader podcast on youtube go and join the 1.2 million on on facebook yes yeah absolutely and for anyone listening, when this course, um, the Silencer and a Critic Expanded Curriculum is out, um, we will actually have a community. And the three of us and Dr. Rosie Kuhn uh, are going to be the four coaches facilitating. And we're all going to have different coaching programs, whether it's uh, one-on-one, group, uh, and select different programs that we're putting together. So keep an eye out. Uh, as we launch this, we're going to put um, with join the waitlist below. And you'll get all the details. So, uh, you know, sign up, join the waitlist, see what's going on. We'll keep you in, uh, in the know over the next couple months. And you'll be one of the first to actually hear about these programs and, and this, this whole expanded curriculum flagship course that we're creating and just kind of what we all as coaches are offering. So uh, if you're connected to anything that uh, Robert or we or Dr. Rosie are 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 doing. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, hear from you and share in the comments below. And we hope to see you in the community.